origins of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Had he lived to see it, the Hungarian 1956 would have also been George Orwell's revolution. His most acute but also most generous mind would have understood and appreciated a modern nation's rising in unprecedented unity and also with striking magnanimity. Stalinist Hungary, indeed, was created to be a version of animal farm. But when the inmates revolted and shook down dictatorship, the driving force was not mere revenge, but also human dignity, the feeling of brotherhood, and the immediate urge to create a new order. A new order in the sense of returning to normalcy, but also restoring order in the metaphysical sense. Can you hear my voice? Is the mic okay? Thanks. <clears throat> As French Catholic philosopher Chantal Del Sol argued, speaking about the peaceful revolutions of East Central Europe in 1989-90, true revolutions are attempts to restore the order of existence. And with this reference, we have at the very outset begun to draw the large historical arc of which 1956 was a glorious peak, and 1987, 1990, another, and whose starting point in Hungary must be sought in 1944-45. But let us return to the horrors of the animal farm experiment of the Hungarian communists that started openly in 1948 after three years of latent preparation and collapsed spectacularly in October 1956. If dignity and magnanimity were demonstrated on the streets and in the revolutionary committees and councils of Budapest and the whole of Hungary in 1956, no doubt there was also a ferociousness, a bravery, and self-sacrifice on the barricades among poorly armed freedom fighters, men and women, and teenagers throwing, throwing Molotov cocktails on Soviet tanks and armored vehicles. There was inevitably the sporadic mobbing of arrested officers of the political police. After the massacre of hundreds of demonstrators at the Hungarian, at the Budapest radio on the night of October 23, and the slaughter of close to 900 peaceful civilians at the parliament, parliament on the morning of October 25. And again, there was the magnanimity of the revolutionaries who set free the captured Soviet soldiers after disarming them. The ferociousness, the rejection of a lukewarm political compromise after the revolution set out on its own course, demanding a free election with democratic parties and the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Hungary, <clears throat> and, and ultimately the dignity of the citizen exceeded the demands of the 1953 June workers' uprising in Berlin, the 1956 summer rebellion in Poznan, and the Prague Spring of 1968. The explanation can be found not only in the systematic ruthlessness of the political police, which was the core institution of Hungarian Stalinism, but the entire eight-year nightmare of the system that was set in motion by the clique of Matyas Rákosi who liked to describe himself as the best disciple of Comrade Stalin and boast with his special relationship with the Soviet leader. According to an anecdote whose source I cannot spot but find very authentic, Matyas Rakoshi said the following in the Kremlin once at a closed gathering of the leaders of the communist East Central Europe in the early 1950s. You have an easy job, comrades. But look, I am trying to build socialism with nine million fascists. Nine million, a little more, was the population of Hungary at the time. The little fraction, 200,000 more, obviously consisted of the activist avant-garde of the Hungarian Communist Party, a dedicated elite bent on building the most cruel and inefficient utopia in, of history on the shoulders of the occupying Soviet army and secret services. Rakoshi was known for his acerbic wit, 
but perhaps he was not aware of the pathological alienation and the paranoid obsessions revealed by his statement. This stunning statement perfectly encapsulates the mentality of the small Muscovite Bolshevik group that Stalin ordained to be the ruler of Hungary after the Second World War. But truly, did the Rakoshi clique make a difference in comparison with the communist rulers of the other occupied countries of East Central Europe? An adage circulating in the 1950s said, the Hungarians received as a punishment what the Czechs and Poles received as a reward. In the larger picture, there seems to be much truth in this witty observation, which neatly sums up what the Paris Peace Conference of 1947 had brought for East Central Europe. Absurd Soviet territorial expansion, a 200-year-old Tsarist dream sanctioned by the Western Allies. Yet the Soviets made sure that Hungary's punishment was to be real punishment, more cruel in fact than the severity of the so-called rewards for the Czechs and the Poles. As it appeared to the famous Yugoslav communist leader, Milovan Gilas, during his conversations with Stalin in Moscow during the Second World War, the Hungarians were something of a psychological complex on Stalin's mind. He respected them and he hated them. On the one hand, he noted to Gilas that the Hungarians and the Poles, who were ruled by strong aristocracies, are strong and proud nations. Strong aristocracy here <clears throat> obviously means, must be understood more broadly, as a strong traditional elite. On the other hand, speaking to Gilas of his blueprint of the, next, of the new post-war order, for East Central Europe, he bluntly said, as for the Hungarians, they are a mere question of boxcars. As it was to turn out, this cryptic statement referred to adequate railway capacity for transporting hundreds of thousands of innocent Hungarians, mostly civilians, to the Soviet Union for Malinky Robot, a little work beginning with 1945, or better, late 1944. These prisoners of war, for that is the precise description of their status, were to work in the mines, on the fields, clearing away the debris, debris reconstructing the war-damaged Soviet industry. Most of these Hungarians were never to return home. They became part of the one million war dead of Hungary, along with the fallen soldiers, the war prisoners who perished in the gulags, the Jewish people deported to death camps or shot by the Nazis in 1944, and the civilian victims of the war theater in Hungary in 1944-45. The Malenki robot transports were made up of men and women, sometimes selected with purpose, like ethnic Germans, because they were Germans, or the Hungarians of Berek County in the Northwest, which the Soviet Union was planning to annex within its own borders. But in most cases, they were just picked up on the streets in the, or arrested in their homes as war bounty in the form of manpower. Like many men who had a key role in the reconstruction of Budapest and its services after the devastation of the, of the siege of 1944-45, <clears throat> my father, an electronic engineer, held a Russian language pass signed by the Soviet military authority, stating his indispensability in Budapest. Yet on one day, as he walked to his offices at the Ministry of Post and Communications, he was picked up by a Soviet army unit in Feutza, Main Street, near the Buda bridgehead of the destroyed chain bridge. Ignoring his pass, the soldiers herded him into the courtyard of a big building to line up in a group to be taken to Malenki Robot. People knew the trick. You should not stand in the front rows because then you fall within the quarter to be deported. My father, who hated tossing, found himself pressed closer and closer to the front positions. The Soviet soldier commander, enraged by the frenzied hassle of the captured, suddenly shouted, about face. The soldiers then separated the first 200 men from the rest perhaps never to be seen by their families again. My father, now standing toward the end of the queue, was saved narrowly 
like race. Such unique stories are known because the protagonists survived and were able to tell them. There have been other such stories preserved among the legends of many families, stories of resourcefulness and good fortune, but they were the exception. Stalin probably not only apprehended the strength of the Hungarian elite, but he regarded harshly Hungary's violent putting down of the brutal 1919 Commune and the strong anti-Bolshevik stance of Hungary's establishment between the two wars. Therefore, he may have designed a more cruel fate to Hungary than Germany's other war allies in the region, Romania and Slovakia. That is why he must have picked the madly vengeful Matyas Rákosi to be the communist plenipotentiary in defeated Hungary. Rákosi was kept in Regent Horthy's prison for 16 years for subversive activities as a Soviet agent. True, Rákosi and his close associates enjoyed civilized comfort and access to books in the Seged Star prison. True, as one of Rakosh's comrades in the prison, Zoltan Vosh, observed later, their custody in Seged most probably saved their lives from Stalin's great purge of the late 1930s, in which many Hungarian emigre communist leaders were exterminate, exterminated, including Béla Kun. Lenin's chief invention and his heritage to the communists was the creation and cultivation of an ideological language in order to reinterpret and mask reality. They invented and kept reshaping a dumbed-down vocabulary for labeling friends and foes. As early as 1920, in revenge for the fall of the Hungarian Soviet Republic, Majas Rakosi and his circle invented the label Horthy regime at a time when Admiral Horthy was not yet in full control of the country. Again released in, uh, to Moscow in 1941, during the two per year, year period of improved relations with the Soviet Union, Rakoshi further develops his aggressive dictionary, eyeing future goals. Speaking regularly to Hungarian war prisoners from 1942 on, he coins the phrase Horthy fascism. Horthy may have been a reactionary and a class enemy in communist terminology, but he had never been a fascist, and even less a Nazi. True, Hungary suffered from grave problems of inequality. And, willy-nilly, in order to appease Hitler, brought laws that curtailed the right of Jews. Yet Horthy, who hated Hitler, was deposed in the Nazi coup in October 1944 because his radio announcement of an armistice and breaking with Nazi Germany, and his prevention throughout the summer of 1944, of the deportation of Jewish people from Budapest to German death camps. At the time, he did not have effective power over other parts of German occupied, the German-occupied country. Yet, as Rakoshi planned it, the invention of haughty fascism came in handy for the Muscovite Hungarian communists from late 1944 on, as their party, still a small minority in the new Democratic National Assembly, began its sneaking four-year campaign against the remnants of the old civil service and officers in Horthy's Hungarian army, even though they may have had a fine democratic and anti-Nazi political record. In the end, against a campaign against the entirety of the upper and middle classes. Of course, like in the Soviet Union, agitprop talk needed the open or secret threat of a strong arm. That was provided for the Communist Party, first of all by the occupying Soviet army, which was to remain here for the entire period until 1991. The Soviets also chaired the Allied Control Commission in Budapest with Kreml's strongman, Field Marshal Clement Voroshilov, at the helm. Their allies were the new secret police, which they had infiltrated and largely controlled from the very first day of its birth in December 1944 in Debrecen. Horty fascism was a term effectively used then in the press of the left against the defendants of the first showcase political trial, that of the Hungarian fraternal community, based on false charges of treason. The main targets of the trial were the politicians, 
with strong connections with the smallholders party, the majority force in parliament, and, predict and creditable anti-Nazis, in brief, prominent patriots with an integrity. Then with the emergence of the Cold War from 1948, new phrases entered the Orwellian dictionary of the communist agit prop. A priest is by definition one who, be, who comes to be described as a clerical reactionary. Anyone being a thorn in the eye of the communists can become a bourgeois element, a class alien, an imperialist agent, a saboteur, and a kulak. These last categories rise to prominence, especially when the communist mismanagement of the economy leads to catastrophic shortages by 1950 and near starvation in a country that even in 1945 reaped one of the record harvests of Europe. You cannot buy proper shoes anymore because of saboteurs of production in the factories and saboteurs among merchants. And you cannot buy butter or eggs because of the kulaks who are hoarding and hiding their produce. In 1950, many Jewish people, entire families who survived the Nazi terror, are deported from the cities to distant farms in the country, together with other class aliens, aristocrats, Hortiites and bourgeois elements, commanded to leave behind their apartments and personal belongings, practically to subsist on forced labor. Then it is not the upper and middle classes anymore. Any person belonging to any class could be branded as an enemy in Rakosi's system. To make a long story short, during the eight-year reign of Hungarian Stalinism, but mostly between 1948 and early 1953, 600,000 Hungarians came to fall under, under legal charges, and many of them under detention by the police and the judicial authorities. Out of a population of less than 10 million people, add family members to the citizens harmed, and you go easily over 2 million. No wonder that the Hungarians received with almost unanimous, unanimous relief the news of Stalin's death on March 5th, uh, 1953. In our class at school next day, we have to stand in silence for a minute, and most of my schoolmates bend down their heads, not in mourning, but to hide glances of relief and outright joy. The new Soviet leadership, divided as it may have been on many matters, recognized symptoms of the deep crisis of, communist, of the communist empire. Matyash Rakoshi was summoned by them to Moscow in charge of a high-level uh, delegation. On June 13th, Lavrenti Beria, who was likely to have had a share in planning or precipitating the death of Stalin, brutally dismissed Rakoshi before his comrades on the occasion, citing on him his personality cult, that is, his dictatorial style, and his blame in the collapse of the absurdly centralized Hungarian economy. Beria also announced that Imre Naj, present there as deputy prime minister, would be the new ruler of communist Hungary. This moment is captured perfectly in Peter Unwin's dedicated but judicious monograph of Imre Naj, Voice in the Wilderness. The personality and career of Imre Naj are charted in English in relevant details in the book. Anwin served two terms separated by several years as Her Majesty's ambassador in Budapest during the Kadar era. I knew him as a highly cultured and sociable man who also understood the complexities of the policymaking process on the highest levels of power. He maintained connections in all walks of Hungarian society ignoring the sensibilities of the government, and he gained a rich knowledge of the present and the past. He knew many Hungarians who were close to Imre Naj or were active in the revolution. Domokos Szentimányi, in his English language memoir of the Moscow armist armistice negotiations in the fall and winter of 1944, recorded a characteristic impression of Imre Naj as a shy, taciturn, an insignificant-looking man. 
Nagy, along with other members of the Muscovite Hungarian detachment in Moscow, including Ernő, Ger Erő, Ger Ernő Gerő, Zoltán Vas, and sometimes Matyás Rákosi, was sitting at the opposite side of the table, along with Molotov, Dekazonov, and Marshal Kuznetsov, during many of the innumerable negotiations that included the planning of Hungary's new political structure and the distribution of key positions between the democratic parties after the imminent defeat of the Nazi Germany. Already then, Imre Nagy may have been deeply suspicious of the Rakoshi coterie, of which, despite his 15 years stay in Moscow as a communist in exile, he was not a member. That must have been the reason that Sentivani never heard a word from him during the negotiations. He was an extremely cautious but persevering man, knowing the viciousness of Rakoshi, and he was binding for his time. As opposed to the middle class, mainly Jewish Rakoshi group, he came from humble peasant origins, fought as an enrolled soldier in the Austro-Hungarian army in Russia. He became a communist as a prisoner of war and fought on the Bolshevik side in the revolution. From 1945, he worked in key positions in Hungary, carrying out land reform and the collectivist modernization of agriculture. He was not part of the power center and was not involved in the running of the coercive mechanism of the communist state. He attempted to bring reason and expertise into the central planning, planning of uh, agricultural production and was also noted for his patriotism as much as this should have been revealed by a cautious member of the communist leadership. But now, with the mandate he received from Beria and Malenkov, the, the Kremlin's chief reformers at the time, Imre Naj suddenly showed his true fiber. He demonstrated extreme concentration and energy in proclaiming his policies of the new phase. July the 4th will remain to many a memorable day in Hungarian history, too. Though not among our official holidays, everyone who was alive and grown up then will remember the evening of July the 4th, 1953. It was a blazing hot summer day, as it should be in early July in Hungary, and in the evening darkness, as I was walking home in my 12th year, all windows were open in the city to let in a cool breeze, and from every window, Imre Nagy's maiden speech as prime minister resounded forth from radios, often from radio sets placed on the windowsills, too. It was a resonant but pleasant and unobtrusive voice with intimate overtones of his native dialect of southern, southwestern Hungary. As the major Hungarian essayist living in exile in London and working for Radio Free Europe, Zoltán Szabó said, the unbelievable happened after so many years of communism. A human voice speaking in parliament to real human beings. A, hum a Hungarian to fellow Hungarians. Morally and intellectually, communism as a doctrine fell in Hungary in that moment. Although in the world of power it remained here to pester us for, an for another 37 years, an obtrusive carcass. It is curious how an earnest and warm voice, using simple language, can change the word just as much, or even more, than the contents of what he says. Zoltan Szabó was right. This was what Imre Nagy created immediately in his first public performance. Authenticity and credibility in a world of lies. He added, Imre Nagy may have been unaware of the full immense effect on the nation of this speech and his voice. He found his way to the heart of the people, and this moment already, his road to martyrdom was fatally decided, Zoltan Sabo argued later. Even though he remained a communist party politician, much dependent emotionally on his party for a long time to come yet, until late October 1956. In the narrower circle of his comrades, at the protracted meeting of the Party Central Committee on June, 19, uh, June 27, 28, he already stated, as a, as a true Marxist, of course, that Hungary had become a police state 
and his government, a shadow government, in the service of the Communist Party. He also said that the party has to, has to resort to self-criticism. This was a favorite phrase of party speak at moments of true or feigned communist reform. In the historical parliament speech itself on July the 4th, he promised the restoration of legality, that is the curbing of police rule, and bringing the hated AVH, Rakush's political police, under the supervision of the interior ministry. He promised the partial amnesty for political prisoners, the stopping of dep deportations and forced labor, and more tolerance for religion. He promised a sharp raising of living standards and the restructuring of the economy. He would abolish costly development priorities in heavy industry. He would, most importantly, restructure agricultural policy, ease the burdens of the peasantry, such as the irreal quotas of produce tax collection, and grant the, high, the right for peasants to return to individual farming if they wish. To further strengthen his credibility, he made sure that his most urgent and important reforms, reforms were all codified in Parliament within a month. The effect was predictable, an immense relief in society. Not himself enjoyed the great opening. He was pleased to see hope, self-confidence, and social creativity emerge soon after his moves in all walks of life. Even though many of the planned reforms would require time to put in place, and resistance to his reforms lurked in many pockets of power. To achieve the release of political prisoners took time. For instance, it took legal procedures of a whole year to set free Janos Kadar, sentenced to prison by Rakosh's court. Too many people still in position had been involved in the excesses. The nation seemed to understand the rule of the game and played it well with Nagy. Success depends on a graduated approach in a complicated situation. Although a new freedom of speech set in and the sins of the Stalinist past came to be discussed widely, passions were kept in check. It was the Soviets who caused the trouble that was to peak in the revolution of October 1956. No doubt also owing to the incessant infighting in Moscow, the opinion began to prevail in the Soviet leadership that Imranoid's new phase was too fast and too dangerous. Supported by Rakosh's strong base in the Hungarian party, led by his ominous gray eminence, Erno Gerö, in early 1955, the Kremlin decided that Rakosh must be brought back to power. They ignored the law that many political thinkers have observed. When you lift off the lid from boiling water, you must keep the kettle open at least halfway. And Rakushi had not earned the other lessons either of his fall. He came back to power with the intention to take personal revenge in the spring of 1955, even though the progress of reforms at large could not be turned back in the Soviet Empire, and Stalinism became a dirty word. Imre Naj was willing to practice partial self-criticism, but his letter to the party leadership was not regarded enough of self-effacement, and he was ousted from the Hungarian Communist Party. After, after suffering two heart attacks, he was recovering slowly, and he withdrew into private life, but he did not budge. He was writing memoranda defending the feasibility and Marxist foundations of his reform. By now, he was surrounded by a large group of reformist intellectuals and politicians, the so-called revisionists, uh, who regarded him as their leader. Tension was, high, was rising so high in Hungary in 1955-56 that the Soviets were again driven to interfere. In June 1956, Rakosh was finally deposed and, harking back to old Tsarist practices, sent into exile into the Asian parts of the Soviet Union. But instead of bringing back Imre Naj, Anastas Mikoyan appointed the evil spirit of Rakosh, the dull hardline apparatchik Erno Geru, to be prime minister. This was a grave miscalculation, an affront to the whole Hungarian nation, 
which was read as an indication of more of the same to follow. Added to the developments of the June Poznan uprising, and with news of unrest in Warsaw, all was set in Hungary for a major opposition protest. And huge student demonstrations took place in Budapest and the major cities on the afternoon of October 23rd, in sympathy with the Polish nation and presenting the radical demands of the Hungarian nation for constitutional and political change. The political police shot into the unarmed crowd at the Hungarian radio on the evening when they demanded the proclamation of the Hungarian youth with their list of political demands to be broadcast. And armed conflict at the radio block of buildings broke out. Hungarian troops ordered to the spot by Gerő handed their weapons over to the demonstrators, some of them participating in the siege of the radio themselves. At the same time, another huge cheering crowd toppled the, the enormous Stalin statue in City Park and hauled its severed pieces to the center of Budapest. With this, the Hungarian Revolution, unplanned and without leaders, had started. Some did seem to plan it, although not on the scale it happened. There is much evidence that hardliners in Moscow and Budapest decided in the summer to ignite a small-scale conflict in order to finally do away with the Imranaj faction of the party and to teach a lesson to the proverbially hot-headed Hungarians. Another strategic goal may have been to create a pretense for Soviet military presence in Hungary, a gateway to Yugoslavia, Austria, and Italy. As American reconnaissance from space clearly indicated, an army of Soviet armored divisions took up positions in the Ukraine and in Romania in a huge semicircle along the Hungarian border during the summer. And how do you explain the fact that General Serov, head of the KGB armed forces, appeared in Budapest in the summer, introduced under pseudonym to the Budapest police commissioner, Sandor Kopacsi, by Ambassador Yuri Andropov, as the new military attaché of the Soviet embassy. Andropov advised the reformist Kopacsi with a meaningful emphasis that he should consult the new attaché in all delicate matters in the months to come. Can we imagine Olen Dulles of the CIA taking up residence in Western Germany for months under a pseudonym because of, say, an imagined military threat from the East. Provocation was certainly an element in igniting the spirits of Hungarians, but the outcome, an armed revolution that humbled the Soviet army units stationed in Hungary, was certainly not in the calculations of the masterminds of the Kremlin and the Gero circle. So much for politicians who like to meddle in engineering history. And I agree with Hannah Arendt that the revolution itself was not a mere response to a possible provocation. It was an immense surge of soul and community wisdom in a whole nation, an event that remained unique in modern history. There is no space here to detail the events of the revolution and war of independence that triumphed by October the 30th. In search of a political solution, Gary and his desperate friends brought in Imre Nagy on the night of October 23 to become prime minister. Yet Nagy, arriving from a vacation, was pathetically out of touch with the situation and set an unfortunate tour before the hundreds of thousands waiting to hear him on Kossuth Square late evening. Comrades, he started his speech in a feeble voice, to be booed by the audience. Nagy was not ready yet to accept an anti-communist revolution, despite strong pressure from his close circle of reformist intellectuals. Declarations of, declarations of ceasefire unobserved by either side were issued by Nagy in the days to come, while he kept reshuffling his governments and kept consulting the two liberal emissaries of the Kremlin, Mikoyan and Suslov, who were commuting regularly between Moscow and Budapest, no doubt, enjoying their trust, he tried to persuade them that concessions, the admission of the most urgent national demands would appease the fighters 
and open a peaceful way out of the mess. As Anwin writes, on 28 October, Nadia made the most significant of his broadcasts so far. He announced the ceasefire, immediate Soviet withdrawal from Budapest, negotiation about Soviet withdrawal from Hungary, and the abolition of the security force as soon as order was restored. On the next day, October the 29th, he went further and disbanded the security police without, with immediate effect. With these commitments, at last, he won attention, says Anwen, closed the gap between leadership and insurgents. On October the 30th, Mikoyan and Suslov spent the whole day in Budapest, bringing with them the text of the Kremlin's declar declaration on changing relations with the so socialist states. When they left Budapest, Anwin writes, Mikoyan and Suslov remained committed to support for Naj government and its decision to concede a multi-party government. But the dramatic reversion of the Kremlin's behavior already took place on that same night as Mikoyan and Suslov were flying back home. The balance tipped on behalf of the hardliners in Moscow and the army leaders who clamored for revenge for their humiliating losses on the streets of Budapest. It was decided, Anwin sums up, that the Hungarian revolution must be destroyed by force. It may have been assumed that Nagy could be detached from the revolutionary leaders and perhaps even put in charge of an administration obedient to Soviet orders. As it turned out, the man who could be detached was to be Janos Kadar, who suddenly disappeared from Budapest. Imre Nagy <clears throat> did not budge at the news of new troops pouring into the country from the 30th and began his fatal journey toward martyrdom. He negotiated throughout the last days of the week with the Democratic Coalition parties on the composition of new representative government and with representatives of various social groups and revolutionary councils bent on establishing a new order. While General Béla Kirai united and consolidated the insurgent forces in a newly created National Guard. At dawn on Sunday 4 November, however, Soviet forces started Operation Whirlwind a general attack on the country <clears throat> and its capital. With an armored force bigger than the German army that occupied Paris in 1940. That was the beginning on, of the end for the revolution, at least on the level of military operations and political revival. However, the life of the Hungarian revolution just blossomed out in that fatal moment not only among Hungarians who in the following months tried all forms of armed and peaceful resistance, of tough negotiation, of demonstrations, strikes, and protests against the Kader regime that only slowly consolidated itself in the spring of 1957. The life of this revolution blossomed out in all of us Hungarians who lived through it, and in everyone in the wide world who sensed its sense together with us a flower of spiritual light that would not fade. George Orwell would have recon recognized it, as I wrote at the outset, but he was no more alive. But there was Albert Camus, another incorruptible spokesman of human freedom, who got ostracized by Jean-Paul Sartre and his friends for his unflinching condemnation of Soviet aggression and of the West's moral and political failure to do what could have been done on behalf of the revolutionaries and the country. This time, I would rather recall a few of the observations uh, to close down. Uh, another profound thinker on freedom recorded in 1957 in her detailed and well-informed analysis of the Hungarian Revolution, Hannah Arendt. In his book, Origins of Totalitarianism, she wrote, this was a true event whose nature will not depend upon victory or defeat. Its greatness is secure in the tragedy it enacted. What happened in Hungary happened nowhere else, and in the 12 days of the revolution, and the 12 days of the revolution contained more history 
than the 12 years since the Red Army had, quote, liberated the country from, from Nazi domination. In full agreement with the observations contained in the secret 1956 diary of Jula Iyesh, just published, who was one of the leaders of the revolutionary intellectuals in Hungary, Hannah Arendt marvels at the way in which the revolution was initiated by the prime objects of indoctrination, the overprivileged, as she says, of the communist system, intellectuals of the left, university students and workers, the communist avant-garde. I quote, their motive was neither their own nor their fellow citizens' material misery, but exclusively freedom and truth. This, she continues, was an ultimate affirmation that human nature is unchangeable, that nihilism will be futile, that a yearning for freedom and truth will rise out of man's heart and mind forever. She also reflects in the same mood of optimism and foreshadowing Chantal Delsol's metaphysical observation on how in spontaneous revolutions, ever since the European 1848, order was immediately created by, a freely by, by freely convened gatherings of citizens. Indeed, the wonder of the restrained and resourceful operation of Hungary's spontaneously formed revolutionary and workers' councils was one of the great social achievements of the revolution of 1956. There was an unmistakable historical streak working here. Taking into account the names of the participants of public life then, we find many prominent or lesser known figures of the Hungarian center that emerged in the reform movements of the 1930s. They were also the active movers of the clandestine anti-Nazi resistance of, of 1944, of the democratic parties and reconstruction between 1945 and 48, and with the unfading of memory of 1956 in their minds, they or their family descendants and friends took a significant role in the new democracy beginning in 1990. It is perhaps in accord with Hannah Arendt's affirmation that this strike had continued to thrive for 60 years and on to our day, despite decimations under communist terror, despite the loss of 200,000 emigres after the revolution, and despite the stupefying 30 years of Janusz Kader's liberal socialism. Thank you.